talking about? How do you even do that? Dude, what? Stay so composed. Why wouldn't I be? You never know when you might get hit by a runaway moped. Is that common? Aren't you afraid of what happens when you die? Well, no. Not really. Oh, that's right. You believe you'll go to a place where there are gumdrop mountains and lollipop woods. You mean heaven? You know, with your chocolate swamps and your forest made of peppermint. I think you're talking about Candyland. I love that game. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, New Hope. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. And uh, we're sorry to say that uh, Mr. Clayton has been feeling sick, and so he's not here this morning. But I want to invite you to take your songbook, if you would, please, and stand together with song number 216. Song number 216, Dwelling in Beulah Land.
I trust that that is true for you this morning. And we want to welcome each and every one of you this morning. Those of you that are visiting, we want to let you know what an honor it is for us that you have taken time to come and visit with us this morning. And uh, we don't take that lightly, and we appreciate that as a blessing. And I want to invite you to fill out this contact card that you can find attached to your bulletin. And we might have a record of your visit if you would fill that out, or if there's any way that we can be of help to you. And of course, uh, even if you're not visiting, and you would like to fill that out, there's a place on the other side for a perfect quest. You can just tear that off and put that in the offering plate at the end of the service. And we appreciate that so much. If we can help you in any way, we would love to do that. While you're standing, please turn in your songbook to number 250. Song number 250, we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5. Verses 1, 3, and 5. There's a thing my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In a love like fair and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest thing I know. Thank you. 
Miss Jerry Purefoy. Because it wasn't a little bird, it was a tall bird came and told me that it was Miss Jerry's birthday today. Is that true? It must be. or like to go to Children's Church, it is just a few feet away through that back door where all the other children are walking orderly in single file. And uh, if you would like to go back there with your children so that you can see where it is and what is going on, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if you would like to help in Children's Church, uh, you are more than happy to... Uh, uh, to do that, or we're more than happy to let you do that, and uh, wouldn't be every week, to occasionally if you'd like to do that, and I know that would be a blessing, but uh, uh, Brother Jim, right, we appreciate him and his wife so much, his lovely wife is, uh, helps out, backing up Brother uh, Butch on our sound system, and, and Brother Jim makes those delightful video announcements. <laughs> So, uh, no, we appreciate Brother Jim and all that he does. Good to have you here at New Hope. Could you lead us in our Bible reading, please, as we all stand together? Good morning. We're going to be reading from John chapter 20, verses 18 and 19. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and, sit and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Let's bow and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your wonderful word, Lord, and we thank you for the peace that, that it gives us. We just pray this morning, Lord, that as Brother Tony comes up and, and gives us a message out of your word, Lord, that, that you'll open the eyes of our hearts, open our souls, that we can receive your word and that it will be planted deep within our souls, and that this week as we go about our lives, when we come across someone that needs to hear this message, that you'll reveal it to their, that you'll reveal it back to us so that we can share that to the people who need to hear it as well. Lord, we just thank you for walking with us in our everyday lives, and we thank you for all that you've done for us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.
we as Christians are so blessed, and we've been talking about for the last three weeks, uh, open doors, and how the people have said so many times, if God would just open the door, uh, I would step through it. If, if, if I knew what to do, if there was a door that I needed to step through, I'd step through it. And God has opened some doors for you and I. They're, they're already open, they're already available, and if you and I would just step through the available doors, everything else would take care of themselves. We talked about that first door of salvation. How that Jesus said, I am the door. There is not another door to go through for salvation other than Jesus Christ. We talked about the second door, the greatest sin that can be committed by a Christian. The sin of a lack of passion. The sin of this mediocre Christian existence. The, the sin of the layout of sayings where Jesus said that uh, you are not hot or cold and that, um, and that because you're not hot or cold, the only church of the seven in Revelation chapter number three where he had nothing good to say about them. And he said, because of that, I stand at the door and knock. And if you'll open up, I'll come in and sup with you and you with me. And I'll help you get that fire back. That fire, that, that, that door of Christian passion that you have only to open the door to Jesus Christ and stir up that relationship with Him because that's that fire. That's where we get that fire, that relationship with Him. Then we talked about last uh, week before last, before I was absconded by the whole youth thing, before they took over, uh, the door of, uh, of purpose. Now, God has a purpose for every believer. Every member of God's body is a minister of God's grace. You are a missionary or you are a mission field. God has a purpose for your life, and that is for you to fulfill, fulfill the purpose for which you were called. He saved us, the Bible says in Ephesians, unto good works. He saved you to be a part of what he's doing in this world. And today we're going to talk about a door that keeps people from fulfilling their purpose and that door that keeps people from having passion. And we're finding here among even his disciples. And that is a door of fear. Look, you can be scary. Last week, if you, if you were here, saw Justin and I sitting up here, um, Justin asked if he could have the Sunday morning service and speak during the Sunday morning service. And then it was his first time to speak here at, on Sunday morning, and, and we were up here, and, and he was nervous. And rightly so, you, you people look scary. <laughs> And it's a nerve-wracking thing to take steps of faith. And how many of you really are just the, what holds us back? Really, only one of two things hold people back from really knowing and serving the Lord. One is a lack of belief. People really just don't believe. It's easy to say belief in it. It's easy to say, yes, I believe in something. It's a whole other thing to really believe to do it. The first is belief. The second is fear. We are scared to live the Christian life. This even happened to his closest followers. We see it in our text verse in John chapter number 20, verse number 18. Mary Magdalene told his disciples, um, she said, I have seen the Lord. I love when Brother Jim read it. He even read it with emphasis, with enthusiasm. When he read it, you could just tell the excitement in her voice. She said, I've seen the Lord. Man, this was exciting. She had this passion. This woman who the Lord had cast out uh, the, the demons out of her. And she had this new life. She went to the tomb and she had seen the Lord. And at the same time, listen what happened. She said, I had seen the Lord. And on the same day, she had told the disciples there in this room. And there, the same day of being even being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were, they were assembled there, the Bible says, for fear of the Jews. I love the contrast. You have two contrasting uh, emotions. You have fear and excitement. You have disciples and you have a woman. You have two completely different stories. And my question today, what makes the difference? What is the difference? What's the difference between these 11 guys who were scared and this one woman who was excited? What makes the difference between a Christian who, who 
They want to serve the Lord. They want to have this passion, but they're just scared. And somebody who's excited and able and willing to do it. Somebody who looks like they're charging hell with a squirt gun full of kerosene. And you're like, I want to be that. I want to be that person, but I don't know. Oh, man, I can't do that. I'm not, I'm, I don't know enough. You know, I talked to two people this week who were very knowledgeable about stuff and weren't doing anything. I, I talked to somebody this week who had cracked the code. They had cracked a biblical code that we're meeting on the wrong day of the week. <laughs> They've done a lot of study, man. They had all kind of verses and stuff and, and all that stuff. And man, now they went into detail about it. And I finally said, look, man, so tell me about your relationship with the Lord and, and where are you meeting with believers on Saturday? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't really, uh, I don't really uh, do that stuff and go to church. <laughs> That was a lot of, you used a lot of words not to really be doing anything. You know the word, the, 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 the little saying I use when I coach basketball, to know and not to do? That's the same as not to know. Don't tell me you know something, you're not able to do it, you're not doing it. That's what happens even with the disciples. They were hiding, the Bible said. The door was locked. And here you have this lady, man. She's out here and she is excited. Just excited. She run up here, probably had to knock on the door for a little while to get the disciples to answer. She busts in there. I've seen the Lord. And they're like, Shh. <laughs> What? We're hiding. Why? I've seen the Lord for fear of the Jews. What is the difference? What makes the difference in the Christian life? Don't you want something different? Aren't you tired of being, if you are a Christian, if you know the Lord, aren't you tired of being one of them clod kickers? Aren't you tired of being in the secret service? Aren't you tired of hiding among the crowd? Because that is not how the Christian life was designed to be lived. It was designed to be lived with passion, with enthusiasm, getting things done. But it's amazing how our life is so many times just wrapped up in fear. If you're scared to die, let me encourage you with just a couple things. First of all, don't ride and get in an automobile because 20% of, of accidents happen in automobiles. But don't stay at home because 17% of accidents happen at home. And don't walk or be on the streets because 14 of accidents happen to pedestrians. Don't travel by rail or water or, or airplane because 6% of accidents happen there. Don't indulge in sports or recreation, 20% of accidents happen there. And don't do anything else because the remaining 14% are miscellaneous accidents. So really, you have one or two options. You can just do what you're going to do, or you can be scared. Somebody say, I'm scared to fly. You don't have to fly. Just get on the plane. Buckle up. The, the pilot will fly. <laughs> if you're that scared, sit in the back. You've never heard of an airplane backing into a mountain. <laughs> I mean, look, you can be scared all day long. What are you going to do? I mean, 14% of the accidents are miscellaneous. It's like the people who work out and stuff all the time. You do realize that the, a lot of people die of natural causes. Just going to be that person. Right? I heard somebody one time tell me, you know, Brother Tony, this God's will that you die healthy. It's still death. <laughs> death is just death, man. But people live their whole life in fear. Not just fear of what might happen physically. We live in fear of failure. Scared to death of what someone might think of us if I live my Christian life the way that I ought to live it. Brother Tony, what my, my friends think, they already don't think much of you. We just talk behind your back. Right? That really is what happened in it. Listen, Babe Ruth hit 714 home runs. Everybody's like, Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth. He hit 1,300, or he struck out 1,330 times. Nobody talks about that. Until you're willing to strike out, you're never going to hit the home run. This is why when you look at a Christian who looks like he's doing these great things, 
You don't see all the time that he ends up on his face. She ends up failing and falling and feeling like a failure. Babe Ruth, 714 home runs, 1,330 strikeouts. Um, R.H. Macy failed seven times in business before his store in New York City caught on. Thomas Edison famously failed 300, over 300 times before coming up with the right combination of the incandescent light bulb. Lincoln was defeated eight times for political office, failed in business multiple times, lost a loved one, and suffered a nervous breakdown before being elected president of the United States. But nobody remembers it as a failure. So you really only have one or two choices. You can hide as a Christian behind the door of fear. Or you can say, hey, I am going to stop being defined by what I cannot do. Brother Tony, what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't work? How is life working now? This morning I went to the gas station. Three general conversations with just people I'm acquainted with. You know how the conversations went? Hey, brother, how you doing? You know, man, this world has problems. <laughs> I'm fine, too. How are you? <laughs> okay, so you're telling me that it's not going so good. So what are you scared of about living for Jesus? I talked to someone, and this has happened on several occasions. I've talked to people for hours and then tell me how bad it is. And then I say, what would keep you right now from turning your back on this world, giving your life completely to Jesus Christ? They're like, I don't know, man, if that'll work or not. <laughs> uh, it already ain't working, bro. I've known you your whole life and ain't seen you made a decision at work. And you scared of Jesus? Well, Brother Tony, I just have some doubts. Doubt your doubts. You haven't been right yet. You ain't been right by love or money or nothing. Why? Because the world's wrong about everything. And so what happens is so many times we're just handcuffed by fear because nobody else is doing it. Let me ask you this. Just think about this this week. Is it possible to be normal by yourself? Is it possible that the majority is wrong and God is right? Is it possible that God is true according to 1 John and everyone else is lying? Is it possible that following your heart will not really work? And that following the plan that God has for your life will work? Over and over and over in Scripture, we see people winning victories if that flies in the face of logic and flies in the face of people's fear. We see people like Moses who was told, hey, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And he's like, oh, no way. I'm still wanting for murder over there. Plus, I don't speak well. Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. This doesn't make sense. And what did it take for him to do it? Did he have to learn to speak well? No. He had to be willing in faith to step outside of that fear and on to the battlefield of faith. And God did the rest. The real question that you and I have to answer today is whether or not we're willing to trust God in faith in spite of fear. Daniel, if you don't stop doing that, son, you're going to die. Well, then I'm going to die. Because Daniel didn't know he was going to survive the lion's den. He didn't know. He just knew that in faith he was going to trust God. Now David, on the other hand, said, Hey, this dude is not going to survive this. He said about Goliath, uh, I'm going to kill you today and take your head. And he did. A, a little bit of a, a backstory on what David did to Goliath, you may or may not know him for months. He drug his head around. I mean, imagine being a friend of David. You're out to eat with David and barbecue. <laughs> David's like, somebody, David, I heard you killed Goliath. Is that true? Is it true? 
Put that thing up, man. We're about to eat. Yeah, it's true. I'll tell you what God can do. I'll tell you why you shouldn't be scared. How is it possible that one woman named Mary Magdalene was excited and 11 disciples who had followed three and a half years were scared to death? Three things. Number one, there were 11 guys who were in the wrong place. They were just in a wrong place. Nowhere in Scripture where you'll see where the Christians all be hiding. Guys, listen, why in the world, if God is who we say He is, would you and I hide? <laughs> I was at the barbershop one time, and used to back when the church was growing, there were a lot of rumors and stuff. Is Mr. Miss, no, I don't want to say that name. Because you never know how things get, get started and rumors get started. This week is just a cool thing. Uh, someone called me and said, Tony, mind if I ask you a question? You can always ask me a question. Any question you want to ask, my life's an open book. It's not a very interesting read. It's at the house. And someone called me and said, Brother Tony, mind if I ask you a question? No, ask me anything. How are you and Rachel doing? <laughs> Great. I think. I mean, I can ask her. You need to. Come to find out, I didn't need to. Because they said, when we heard, you got divorced. <laughs> I said, that's horrible. <laughs> Um, let me ask her. <laughs> she was in the kitchen. I said, Rachel. No, and this is true. You can ask her. Did you divorce me? No. No. <laughs> We're still together. <laughs> you never know. We used to, man, the rumors were really flying about New York Baptist Church. And I'd go to the barbershop and I'd say, back when AJ was cutting hair in Diana. And uh, I'd say, AJ, what is going on at that church? And whoever was sitting there would know that I was pastor, boy, they would get to talking, and I would just sit, sit back and listen. They wouldn't know it was me. And then AJ hated it. He, and so he got to where when I'd walk in, he'd say, hey, preacher. And so I couldn't do it. But anyway, it's amazing, and that people are scared to death to be that person. And you know what people would say? You know what people don't like to talk about? Religion and politics. Well, there are two things that probably change your life more than any. Somebody might want to start talking about what God can do for mankind. I had a conversation in the ditch in Diana yesterday. Now listen, man, we don't have a political problem primarily. We don't have a financial problem primarily. We have a God problem. Because when people leave God, they start doing each other wrong. You know, okay, man, look. Whatever, it is what it is, you don't have to listen to it. That was worth everything you paid for. But, at some point, the Christian needs to just say, God's right and I'm wrong. But we're scared because we're in the wrong place. Nobody minds talking about it in here. And even in here, it's kind of weird. Brother, I don't know if I want to be baptized. It's kind of embarrassing. You're in front of Christian people. All of us look like salt in the salt shaker. We, we all are singing... Shall we gather at the river to bless be the tie that binds in here? Man, we sure can't do it out there if we can't even do it in here. We can't say, man, I'd just like to thank the Lord for what He's doing in my life. We're scared to death. We might get embarrassed. One of my favorite things that ever happens, there's two days, two things I really enjoy happening at church when I'm sitting up here. One is when people stand for a song and sing and they don't realize they're the only one standing. That's all good. I'm sorry. I just enjoy it. I enjoy the look on your face when you realize I'm the only one. You sit down, it's just awesome. And then the other day is like daylight savings time. When you come in during the invitation, <laughs> and we are, we've already, we're already done with church. And you're late for church. And, uh, and, and you don't know it. You think you're right on time or early. You walk in, you're like, they must be already singing. What's going on? And you don't realize that church is over. And uh, just the look on people's face, why? Embarrassment is not the worst thing that can ever happen to us. We're just in the wrong place in our mind. Church can even be a place where we hide, like the disciples were hiding. Listen to what happens to Mary Magdalene. John chapter number 20, verse number 11. Let's kind of just look at the story of what happens. The Bible says, And Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping, and she wept, and stooped down, and looked in the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white. Now, usually we just kind of read over that, but 
I don't know when the last time you was at a graveyard by yourself, but if you went into a sepulchre and there's two guys sitting, one at the head and one at the foot, dressed in white, that'd be disconcerting to me. And still she's not scared. Why? She's in the right place. She's going where she knows Jesus is supposed to be. Yet she's not scared. One at the right, one at, one, one at the head, one at the foot, uh, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Why weepest thou? Now then the strangers are asking her questions. And if you ladies start getting nervous and uncomfortable at this point, you're at the graveyard by yourself, you're in the sepulcher, two strangers are in there, now they're asking you questions. Why are you here? Uh, she says, uh, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him, laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. Now she's surrounded. Still not scared. Why? Because she's on a mission to see her Lord. You see, when you're at the right place, the Bible says when you commit your way into the Lord, then your thoughts will be established. We're waiting for the thought of fear to get out of our life, then we'll do something. Lord, if you'll take away this fear, then I'll step out on the battlefield. And the Lord's like, no, step out on the battlefield, and then I'll take away the fear. It's like the old farmer back in the day when they bought everything out of Sears and Roebuck magazine, where he was going to buy the motor, and he called Sears and Roebuck and said, if you'll send me that motor, if the motor's any good, I'll send you a check. And they, they said, if you'll send me a check, if it's any good, we'll send you the motor. <laughs> and that's how we want to act with the Lord. Lord, if you will take away the fear, then I will fight. He's like, no, if you will fight, I'll take away the fear. Justin was telling me, man, I was looking out. Uh, when I was sitting up here last week, you want to know what we was talking about? There's a lot of people here. <laughs> so then when I get up there, I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do this or not. Then when I get up there, I'm like, man, listen, I know God has given me something to say. And then before it's over, it's like, I can't wait to do this again. <laughs> How do you get rid of fear? You don't get rid of fear by asking God to remove fear. You get rid of fear by going to the right place. Brother Tony, I just don't think I can go to Peru. Yeah, you can. So you can buy a ticket. I remember the first time I got my ticket to Peru. When the plane, when the, when the wheels left the ground, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to Peru. What am I going to do when I get there? I don't know. How's it going to be? Not sure. We're just going. I remember when I, full, when I surrendered to full-time Christian service. I remember when I was at the altar, half praying, Lord, we can do this, half thinking, this is dumb. Just surrendering to the Lord, you can have my life. Whatever it is that you want out of my life, you say go and I'll say yes. That's scary. And talking to Rachel about it and what that means and what that looks like for our life and where we were going to end up. We didn't know we were going to end up somewhere like this. But do you believe it enough to say, Lord, you tell me what to do and I'll go. Lord, if it makes me look dumb or feel out of place, I'll still go. But you put me in the right place and I'll go. That's the only way to get out of the door of fear. Time after time after time, you see Christians who have no passion because they live in fear. What's my family going to think? What's my friends going to think? What would the community think if I live for Jesus? What would my community think? What would my friends think? What would my family think if I didn't go where they went and do what they did and act like they acted and talk like they talk? What if my life looked like Christ? What would people say, think, and do? You have no, you have no idea. What kind of fruits of the Spirit would manifest in your life? Love, joy, peace. Those things that you're trying to pursue in this life that you've never been able to gain, that God promises if you'll just commit to Him, and you're scared to go out and get what He says you can have. Because you're in the wrong place. Because you just won't get up and go. How many times have you stood in a pew during an invitation and thought to yourself, man, I really ought to go down there and just commit to the Lord. They couldn't do it at church. And don't feel out of place because the disciples couldn't do it either. Here in their life, this time in their life, they were scared too. And don't feel out of place because I've been at the same place too on several occasions. Even this last week where I knew I needed to talk to somebody and felt like I needed to talk to somebody and I was like, I don't want to do that. Listen, nobody is that Christian who just loves to talk to somebody that they know really don't want to talk to them. 
Nobody wants to go talk to somebody and feel like they're an insurance salesman. Right? Knowing good and well that the majority of people don't want to have that conversation. But at the same time, if you're in the wrong place, you'll never overcome your fear. Number two, the wrong time. They were there at the wrong time. When were they there? The Bible says the same day being the first day of the week. What's so significant about the first day of the week? They knew this was resurrection day. The Bible says from that time forth in Matthew chapter number 16, there was a time when Jesus began to tell them that, um, uh, began to show his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That wasn't a time to be hiding. That was a time to be looking for Jesus. It was the third day of the week. It was the resurrection day. They ought to have been sitting looking for Jesus to do something incredible. Instead, they were hiding. This is the time for you and I to be, we're waiting for Jesus to come out and, and, and manifest himself. And we talk about it all the time in church. But you're never going to see it if you're hiding behind the door of fear. Behind the door of fear. Until you decide, Lord, you lead me and I'll follow. You feed me and I'll swallow. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I'm tired of living like the world tells me how to live. And I'll follow you and I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll completely sell out to you. No fear, we're just going. If it looks like you, I'll do it. If it looks like the world, I'll get rid of it. What would your family, what would your friends say? I'll tell you what they'd say. Don't go off the deep end. And what am I telling you? Go off the deep end. I used to be scared to death riding rides at Six Flags because when I was little, we didn't have money to go to theme parks. So the first time I ever went, I went with my future wife. I loved the town with Rachel Pierce. And she had been to several theme parks. She loved riding the things, and I had never seen them except for on the picture. And they looked way smaller on the picture. Like that picture. She's like, let's ride. And I remember the first one, I just stepped through. I'm like, I'm not riding that thing. That dude's like, 13 years old pushing them buttons. He has no business running something like this. <laughs> so finally they guilted me into it, riding and I'm riding, and it was years before I ever rode one of the things with my eyes open. But it was amazing how much more I began to enjoy it as I began to embrace what it was. And at some point, you just got to get on the ride and sit down. I realized I didn't have to ride. All I had to do was be brave enough. That 15 seconds of bravery. All you got to do is sit down, let them drop that bar, strap you up. The rest is going to happen by itself. That, Justin Hart called it 15 seconds of insane bravery. The rest happens by itself. And so many of us just need that 15 seconds of insane bravery to go from one side of the door of fear to say, that's it, I'm done. I'm done being scared. I don't know what's on the other side of this door, and I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm not staying there anymore. I'm not hiding in church anymore. I'm not hiding behind whatever other people are doing anymore. I'm not hiding behind being scared of somebody saying, don't go off the deep end, don't get too religious, and you're too heavenly minded to be too earthly good. Well, good, because I've never seen much earthly good, to tell you the truth. I've never seen them be very good at much. So, I'm done being scared. Done being scared of what the world says. I'm done being scared of being called a neophyte. I'm done with fear. I'm going to go, because why? This is my time. The Bible says this. You are children of the light. You are children of the day. I want to know, too, why they're in this room during the daytime. Just that. Why are you hiding in the room during the day? The Bible says you're not children of the night. You're children of the day. Christians have business during the day. The Bible says the, uh, in verse number uh, uh 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse number 5. Ye are all children of light and children of the day. Verse number 8 says, Let us uh, who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 13 says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today. You don't think you have a lot of time, do you? 
Those guys said, hurry up, the Lord's coming back. That's right. You have today. The Lord is working today. How long are you going to hide behind the door? As soon as something miraculous happens in my life. Something has miraculous happened. He is risen. There's new life in the believer. Today is the time. And lastly, the wrong reason. They were hiding in that room for the wrong reason. They were in the wrong place. No need for Christian to be hiding. It was the wrong time. This was resurrection day. Jesus has risen, and there's something for you and I to do. And they were in there for the wrong reason. The Bible says that they were in this room for fear of the Jews. You see, there are one or two things that you and I ought to fear in this life. But the only Christian ought not fear anything. That's not true. The Bible says in verse number 19, the same day being even the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus. You got one or two things you can fear. The Jews or Jesus. People or Jesus. You might as well fear one. You should fear one or the other. Brother Scott and I were talking this morning. He said, man, time just seems to be flying by. I can't believe it. it's all, almost all halfway through uh, August already. I'm like, yeah, you think that's fast. It won't be long. You'll be looking Jesus eyeball to eyeball. That's true. And then what? Then you're going to have to explain why he gave you three talents. He going to say, I gave you three talents. Well, you give me. In return, better not be excuses either. Gave you three times to invest on my behalf. What'd you do with it? Go. Lord, you know, I was busy and I was scared that I was going to. I'm sure I've read that somewhere before. Isn't that exactly what the one with one talent said? Well, I was scared I was going to lose it. And I knew you were somebody who reaped where you didn't sow. And Bob, listen, man, it's time to quit being scared and invest our life and time for Him. Do you believe it will work? Do you believe that there really is a God who deserves to be served? If you do, it changes everything. And the only other thing you need to do, the only other thing besides completely believe that there's a God who really exists in your life is stop being scared. Remember when you first dove off the diving board? Remember you were scared to death. You were like, I'm not going head first in that water. That just sounds dumb. That first time you dove, then for some reason you thought you was Greg New Gaines or somebody. Whoever, I think that's a diver. <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Then you were an expert, then you were good at it, then you enjoyed it. It's the same thing, man. Dive in. Now is the time, and the reason is plain. Stop being scared. Matthew chapter number 10, verse number 27, and we'll close with this verse. The Bible says, What I tell you in darkness, speak ye in the light. That is a command. Be a light to this world. What I've shown you, show other people. And I know other people don't agree. And I know people think that it's not worth investing your whole life in. But what I've shown you, he says, show other people. And what you hear in the ear, that preach upon the housetop, and fear not them which kill the body. In this day, when you profess to be a believer, it could cost you and your family your life. For us, we're scared to death. We're going to get made fun of. Which is weird since we're already so funny looking. We do weird stuff all the time anyway. It's just, it's just amazing. Just what life is. But here we see that fear not them which kill the body and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father? He makes here this point of the temple versus the eternal. Which one are you going to fear? Which one are you going to invest your time in? The temporal versus the eternal? Which one are you scared? Which one do you think you've got to do? Yeah, Brother Tony, i got to fill in that blank. Because that will tell you what you fear. I have to what? 
Get a piece of paper tomorrow, fill it out. I have to, boom. And it'll tell you what you fear. If it's, I have to do this with money, and I have to do this with family, and I have to do this, then you'll be able to tell. You're scared to death you're going to lose that stuff. And I wonder how many spots on that piece of paper will have anything to do with anything eternal. You do know you're going to be dead longer than you're going to be alive, right? You do know you're going to die, right? Sooner rather than later, that one of you are in, in this room or next. One of you, congratulations, are last. And everybody else is going in the middle. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It will not last. I was telling Mike Taylor this morning, so listen, I could die today and two months later, nobody even in this church would care. Not in a real sense. Y'all will have adjusted to a brand new normal. Fact of the matter is, all of you wouldn't be at my funeral. I asked my wife one time, I said, if I die, would you remarry? She's said, well, I'm kind of young, I guess I would. <laughs> so would you let, her, let the guy drive my truck? <laughs> well, he didn't have a truck, I guess. Would you let him live in his house? <laughs> well, I guess. <laughs> so would you let him sleep in his bed? <laughs> Oh, what's the big deal? I mean, you'd be gone. So would you let him use my golf clubs? She said, no, he's left-handed. <laughs> so that's how important I am. That story was fictional. Just so we're clear. But the point is this, that's really... We're not that important, but we are going to die. We are. We should fear not having bested ourselves in something eternal. The Bible goes on to say in verse number 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for this, for my sake, will find it. The world does not appreciate people who do not fit its mold. In 1660, England passed the law forbidding preaching outside of state churches. John Bunyan was arrested when he refused to preach, um, to stop preaching um, outside of independent churches in England. He was offered his freedom, but would not stop. Bunyan replied, if you let me out of jail today, I will be preaching tomorrow. This statement made, uh, was made when he was 32 years old, and it cost him 12 years of his life. For 12 years, he lingered in a stinking and crowded jail in Belford, England. For the sake of the gospel, he gave up 12 years with his wife and children. For 12 years, he missed uh, his children growing up. For 12 years, he was growing old in prison while his children were growing up. For 12 years, he suffered isolation and darkness confined um, away in a... Uh, from the blooming flowers of sunshine. He watched 12 summers, 12 autumns, 12 winters, and 12 springs slip, slip past. For 12 years, his wife Elizabeth cooked meals and sent them to the jail by Mary, his blind daughter. For 12 years, his little blind daughter made her way through the streets of the city to the prison with food. To the embarrassment of the Bel Bel Belford fathers, he wrote a book in that jail that made him famous. Book was called Pilgrim's Progress. The world remembers John Bunyan as a Christian who was dedicated to his faith. Now, John Bunyan did not know at the time that he would be remembered. He just knew that he would not compromise his faith. He knew he would not surrender to fear. The world does not, however, remember the Bell Fathers. And I'm just wondering today how you will be remembered in eternity. As the musicians come, you and I are living this life. And if you and I had our lives written as Scripture was written, 
You know, David had his life written down from the time he was a youth to the time he was uh, died as king of Israel. I wonder what it would look like. And Tony Pierce approached the battlefield, and there was a giant, and he cowered away because he was just scared to fight. He did not believe God would come through for him. Is that how it would read? How every time I, as a Christian, faced a battle, I just wouldn't do it because I was scared? There's a door in every one of our lives. It's a door of fear. I just wonder if you're willing to stop hiding behind the fear. Say, Lord, I believe you enough to I follow. Lord, you lead me and I'll follow. You show me where to go. You show me what to do. And I'll do it. And I don't care what it costs. And I don't care what it looks like because I believe in the eternal more than I believe in the temporal. I don't care if it costs me money. I don't care if it costs me time. I don't care if it costs me relationships. I'm done being scared about what I don't even know it's going to cost. As the candidates for baptism go back, I just wonder today what's holding you back. What fear? What are you scared of in the Christian life? As we stand together, maybe you don't even know Christ. Maybe you've been scared to even commit your life to Christ. Well, Tony, I don't know what it looked like, but you know what the world looks like. How's that mean? My guess is disappointing. Today, if you don't know Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, would like to come to know Him. It's going to be a great time. Leave the door of fear and come to know Christ. If you know Christ and just been scared, live for him. This would be a great day to come to this altar and make a commitment to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm done living in fear. As we sing today, Brother Scott, 159. 159. If you need to come, this altar's open. As we sing, if you need to come, you come. Make a commitment today.